these games are not going into places where there's no people, right? And they are displacing people. They are um, um, upending uh, communities. And necessarily, it's going to do so. It's like like water travels, you know, downhill. Uh, they're going to go to the place where there's the least amount of political resistance, as a which is almost always a function of 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 basically people who are living in low income or poor areas who don't have the political power to push back, even if they're if they are just as uh, inclined not to want the Olympics there as anybody else. Absolutely. In fact, often what we see with the Olympics is that it targets public housing. I was in Tokyo with the great sports journalist Dave Zyron. We were writing stories for The Nation magazine back in July 2019. And we interviewed two women who were displaced by the 2020 Olympics from public housing. They were also displaced by the Olympics in 1964 in Tokyo, the same women. I mean, incredible story. So the Olympics tend to decimate public housing and it's not just a Japan thing. In the United States, in Atlanta, 1996, huge public housing communities were destroyed to make way for the Atlanta 1996 Summer Olympics. And so, yes, this is definitely one of those central dynamics displacement. You look at China and what happened when Beijing hosted the 2008 Olympics, 1.5 million people were displaced to make way for venues. That's breathtaking, 1.5 million. I lived in Rio de Janeiro in the lead up to and during those Olympics, I had the good fortune of being a Fulbright Research Fellow then. And I worked with communities that were also displaced and decimated. Some 77,000 people, 77,000 displaced from their homes in Rio de Janeiro to make way for Olympic venues. And behind every one of those 77,000 people is a human with a story. And I, I just got to interview tons of people and, and hear about the sad elements of getting displaced and their lives were destroyed by these Olympics. And, and this is just what happens in every single Olympics. The general trend I would just say in, in closing on the displacement is that with the global south, it tends to be more forced eviction and just good luck to you. In the global north, north, it's more like gentrification and displacement. So with the upcoming games in Los Angeles, what we're seeing is areas that are going to host the Olympics are already being gentrified, and it's just going to get turbocharged by the games and pricing out people, moving people to the periphery, if not to being in unhoused status. Uh, let's talk about L.A. This is a sort of uh, the focus of your book, at least in terms of like the activism in 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 um, and fighting against these games. Um, this, uh, and, and, and much of it centers around the uh, DSA. Talk about the, um, w how the activism is constructing itself into in, in fighting, uh, the, these games and maybe give us a little bit of history of how these games were introduced. Um, I think it was 84 was the last uh, set of games in LA, um, just give us a little background as you, as, as you wind into how the activism is building itself in, in opposition to these games. Absolutely. So you're right. Los Angeles hosted the Olympics twice before, once in 1984 and once in 1932. In 1984, a lot of people that study the Olympics point to it and say, hey, at least they didn't hemorrhage tons of money. They did spend more than they said they were going to. But at the end, they did have a little bit of a surplus, about 200 or so million dollars. And so people point to that and say, oh, look, success. They didn't just lose all this money. There was some tremendous downsides to those Olympics. So when I was in Los Angeles, I interviewed a lot of people that were around in 1984. And I noticed right away that memories of 1984 Olympics are classed and they are racialized. If you're a person of color who's not rich in Los Angeles, there's a very good chance that you do not remember those Olympics with total fondness. If you're a white person who is relatively affluent, then you tend to look at those games and think, wow, how wonderful they were. And it was because of people like the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, and a sort of media baron by the name of Casey Wasserman, who were there in 1984, two white men, I should point out, that did have a great time, and they wanted to bring the Olympics back to Los Angeles. And so when they did, they were met by serious activism. And so my book, No Olympians, chronicles the rise of two political forces, anti-Olympics activism globally, as well as the rise of democratic socialists of America and the United States. It also declines the, it also looks at the decline of interest in the Olympics, and it all kind of comes together in Los Angeles, where you've got this really smart, savvy group of activists that came out of the Democratic Socialists of America's Housing and Homelessness Committee. And they're talented, they're creative, they bring in actors and comedians like James Adonian and Kate Berlant, 
uh, to play a part in their activism. And they play kind of an inside outside game. I was down in Los Angeles when they were testifying at City Hall, but they're also on the streets and they're organizing in this huge coalition across the city from Black Lives Matter LA to the Los Angeles Community Action Network to uh, all these other various groups in town. And it's really interesting what they're doing right now and doing all sorts of creative activism along the way. I mean, talk about that that notion of, of I, I don't know if intersectionality is really the word in this, but it, it, there is a... Um, it, it seems uh, analogous to the um, social justice movement in unionism that we're seeing in some places where um, the there is a broader portfolio of issues than at least in the context of this unionism than what is facing directly the union at any, any point. It is both it is both a mechanism to fight the specific issue you're fighting with, but also to build broad alliances uh, locally to strengthen everybody's sort of particular issue set so that you're actually making a movement. Yeah, I really like that way of looking at it. Basically, the Olympics are this monstrous juggernaut that when it rolls into your city, you've got all these activist groups that are already working on their various issues, whether it's housing issues like the LA Tenants Union are working on in, in Los Angeles, uh, and gentrification issues, uh, whether it's policing issues like Stop LAPD Spying, they're already working on these issues. And then what you need though is sort of an activist hub to bring them all together, to work together as a coalition and use the Olympics as a way of focusing energy on all of their campaigns. So everybody really benefits. I mean, the Olympics do generate a lot of social attention. It's a great way of grabbing people's attention, especially if they consider themselves to be apolitical, but they like sports. And so you can start a real po political conversation by talking about the Olympics and then bring it down to these issues that you care about. And what I noticed over time in, in working in Vancouver, I lived in London during the Olympics and before the Olympics as well, is that it does bring together these interesting coalitions that tend to stay together and fight together after the Olympics as well. And so that's what, what's really interesting to me about the Olympics is that they often talk about having these great legacies that they leave behind. And a lot of times they're just hocus pocus, the actual legacies. But one of the real legacies that they inadvertently may leave behind is these activist groups that continue to fight together uh, after the games are gone. Because you know before what we've seen in the last year or so, which is a transnational movement, prior to that, fighting the Olympics was essentially a game of activist whack-a-mole. Like it would pop up in the city, the security forces and locals would try to tamp it down and then the games would be over and then they'd stay down. And then the next city would come up and it would pop up in the next city. What DSALA and the No Olympics LA group that emerged out of DSALA is trying to do is create more of an international movement. And they've been successful. They had the first ever transnational activist anti-Olympic summit in Tokyo in 2019, where you had activists from all around the world come and share strategies. And that takes the moment of anti-Olympics activism and tries to turn it into a movement that has legs to move from city to city through time. That's what they're trying to do and the people in LA are at the forefront of that right now. How much is, um, the, how much does anti-capitalism motivate the anti-Olympics protest? And, and how much is it that uh, it just so happens that the Olympics are a really good manifestation of things that are problematic about capitalism. Right. I mean, the way we were talking about the Olympics before, it's essentially an example of trickle up economics to benefit the rich. And so it gets a lot of activist groups fighting against it. I think in terms of the amount of anti-capitalism that you see very much depends on the city. In Los Angeles, there's a lot more people that are talking about capitalism and bringing it into discussion, which makes sense since it's DL DSALA that's kind of at the lead there. Other cities, it's not so much. It really very much depends on the city. You know, one of the things about the Olympics, though, is that it can bring together activists from across the political spectrum. And I want to take us all the way back to 1976 to an Olympics for Denver. You, you might be thinking, Denver Olympics, 76? I don't remember that one. That's because it never happened because activists across the political spectrum stood up and said no. So they were given the Olympics in the early 1970s. And then people that are fiscal conservatives are like, we're spending money on what? Like, that doesn't make any sense in terms of the way we see the world. You had all these left uh, activists in the environmental sphere come together and say, we're going to destroy our mountains. We're going to Californicate uh, Colorado. Don't, that was one of the slogans, don't Californicate Colorado. And they actually came together, these two groups, 
got a ballot measure on the on the ballot, Colorado a wide vote, and they said no to the Olympics. We're not going to give you any money. And so the International Olympic Committee was forced to move those Olympics to Innsbruck, Austria. So it's one of those weird things, the Olympics, where it can actually bring together people across the political spectrum to say no to the games. It really is, I think, like a uh, such a perfect example of like f- full on pure Mount Pelerin style neoliberalism, right? <laughs> where it's where it, it really is like um, ostensibly a a a private enterprise on some level, but it is so it is so much just a direct uh, semi direct transfer of public wealth, essentially. Um, to private hands, and uh, and then on top of it, there's huge social costs that are completely sort of um, socialized, uh, whereas all of these uh, private um, uh, profits are, are 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 taken by the same sort of group of people. Sometimes they open up the doors and it's like, yeah, we're going to give some to the local um, uh, versions of us, and then we're just going to move on to another locality. I mean, it really sort of impressive in that in in that respect folks there's more of what you've just saw where that came from that's if you hit the subscribe and like button thank you really thank you